Hello, today I have something mechanical for you. This is uh, the robotic hand of a storage tape library. The manufacturer was Grau Storage Systems, it's a German manufacturer. Um, this unit, this hand, this gripper, however you call it, uh, is from 1960, uh, 1996, so it's quite a bit old, but I think it's an amazing piece of mechanical and pneumatic um, um, engineering. So I want to show you how it works and we probably take it apart. So, the first thing you see here is this pusher mechanism. This is used to push the cartridge that is held by this gripper here into the slot where it belongs or where it should be stored. Then the whole assembly here can be turned by 180 degree. So you can grip a cassette, turn it over. Um, the reason for that, I think this unit here was manufactured to handle different type of cassettes, maybe even uh, the old VGS, uh, VHS uh, video cassettes. And, uh, well, you don't have to turn them around, but for example, if you're using a video 2000 or a, I don't know if, if Betamax is uh, two-sided, I don't remember. So, however, uh, it is also possible that the tapes are stored in a horizontal uh, direction, while the drive is possibly uh, installed in a vertical direction, so you also can turn just 90 degree. I will show you how that works. Then we can tilt the entire SC here. It has a very strong spring underneath. Um, what functions do we have? We have everything here is on springs. That means if the robot hits something accidentally uh, or Maybe he tries to put a cassette into a slot that is already occupied. The unit here will uh, be pushed back and down here. There is uh, this uh, bracket here. There was origina originally a, a proximity sensor here. I removed that because I needed it for something else. So that would detect if the whole unit slides back and tell the robot to search for another place for this cassette. Then here we have a big D connector that simply connects uh, the valves here. There are pneumatic valves, four on this side and then another four up here. That means we have um, four pneumatic cylinders and each one is um, operated in both directions. So you need two valves for each cylinder. More or less because here is only one function for the, for the tilting mechanism. And the other function I will explain later. So what I made is this here. It's just a small board with eight buttons for one for each um, valve. I connected them to this big D connector. So I figured out where 
the connections here are going. It's not too complicated. There is a common ground for all the for all the valves, and uh, there are eight inputs that are connected to the eight valves here. Then we have here a small hose for the pressurized air. I will connect that to my little compressor here. So the connection is very simple. It is a sort of quick connectors. You just plug it in and the more pressure it gets the better it, uh, it stays in. To uh, release that you just have to push that ring back and take it out. So we have no pressure at the moment. So let's have a look on the compressor. That's the original compressor that was uh, together with this uh, robotic hand. This, uh, this one here has never been installed. It came from a spare parts kit as well as the robotic hand there. So we have an electric motor here, it's just a normal AC motor for 230 volts, 1.66 amps. It has a capacitor here on the other side to make it run. This one is the compressor part with the piston, with the um, cylinder here. That's the air filter, the black part here, air goes in, is pumped here to this metal uh, hose here to the pressure tank. Here is the input of the pressure tank. This here is a, a pressure switch and also the main on and off switch, which is connected to the pressure uh, line here. Um, this switch here has two functions. It does, uh, first of all, it switches off when the pressure is high enough. And it does also, also depressurize um, the cylinder to make the, the compressor, uh, to make an easy start for the compressor when and then it turns on the next time. So uh, that's something almost every compressor has. A little bit a special thing is this unit here. It's an electromagnetic solenoid with a, an electronic circuit here. Maybe we can see that. Oops. It's a little bit heavy. So you see there is a, a trim pot where you can set some timing and what this does is it opens this valve here for a certain amount of time that you uh, set here on the pot. Then it blows out air through this hose here into that bottle. It's just a plastic bottle. And there is also uh, a tube that goes to the bottom of the tank, so it uh, literally sucks out all the moisture, all the condensed water from the tank. And in the same um, moment when it does that, it also, this is some sort of a venturi uh, valve, it also sucks out all the moisture of these filters here. You see there is the first one here is a pressure regulator. You can turn that knob here and then the regulate the output pressure. So my output pressure at the moment is 3 bar. Oops, 5. I should open the output valve first. 5 bar. Then we have a two-stage um, filter 
because uh, they wanted to have the air absolutely dry and clean so they have two filters in series each one of them has its own uh, uh, water um, removal line here that also goes into this bottle so that unit is made to work without any maintenance maybe from time to time you have to empty the bottle but I think in a good uh, air-conditioned computer room you don't need to do anything ever. Okay, that's the compressor. So let's go back to the hand. Okay, everything is connected. We have pressure on the uh, pressurized airline here. We have uh, 24 volts supply that's the power supply you hear in the background and let's play with it Oops, that's the the tilting mechanism this button here seems to do nothing at the moment here we have the rotation 180 degree from bumper to bumper now if I push the first button here we only do a 90 degree so the first button here activates uh, a stop in the middle of the travel here so we only have 90 degree if I release that button, we go back to 180 degree. You, go, you can also hear the air escaping here. Okay, let's see. These four buttons here are for the top assembly here. Oops, it turns back because this cable here is relatively stiff. That's the. Oops, it's a little bit on the edge of the picture. That's the shover, shoving mechanism that pushes the cassette into the slot. It has also springs, so it comes out by itself, but it's very weak. And if I push the other button, pushes up okay and the other one is the gripper so we have to pull that pusher back that's the gripping mechanism it takes the cassette and then the whole assembly is on an arm that moves that way and also in all the other directions to place the cassette uh, wherever it should go. So, here this is a, a, some sort of proximity sensor, it's an, an optical sensor, it has a transmitter and a receiver. I have to plug this out again, switch off the noise, um, that sensor also has uh, a potentiometer to uh, calibrate the sensi uh, sensitivity, so this uh, sensor here checks if the slot where the cassette is going is free or not and in case it doesn't detect it and the slot is occupied you have this spring mechanism I'm not sure, I, I don't think they are reading barcodes with this uh, it doesn't have the resolution for barcodes it's just uh, some, something that tells you there is an object or not 
Um, well, I think that's it from the function. So we can start to disassemble the unit and see how it is made. So I just removed that cable to show you something else. So maybe you can see that with a li little bit less light. Each of these relays here has, has a little LED that shows you when it is activated. So every time when I push a button and this uh, valve here clicks because it's an uh, electric magnet, electromagnet inside, you see which one is activated. So I first disconnect this hose here to have it out on my, of my way. You see you just unscrew this uh, ferrule here and slide it off. Then I put it back because I don't want to lose it. I think some of the parts here can be very useful for other projects. So, let's see what happens here. And when I see, let's see, so you should be able to see it also. So I don't have any instructions how to disassemble that unit, but I think if I just remove all the screws, it will fall apart sooner or later. So here we have another sensor thing, it's a, how do you call that, the plunger that is pushed back if a, when a cassette is uh, in the gripper and if there is no cassette it doesn't push back. And here is a, a proximity sensor um, that reacts to this metal piece here and the metal piece goes over the green sensor area it is detected and the robot knows if there is something in its gripper or not Um, when I first got this unit, this is now a couple of years ago, I googled for this uh, Kians uh, PZ101 uh, sensor and I found out that this sensor alone costs between 100 and 200 dollars, so when it was new. Now it's all technology, but I think it will still work and it probably could be used for something nice.
There is another of these proximity sensors and another one and the third one here. So they are, have sensors for almost every possible movement here. These sensors are very simple. You need a supply voltage, you need ground, and then you have a signal output that goes high or low depending on the model uh, as soon as it detects something. These sensors here uh, are made to detect uh, metals, magnetic metals like steel or yes, something like that. They don't work very well on aluminium or better they don't work at all. So you need something magnetic. And uh, that's the reason why this bracket here is made of steel and while well, the rest here is more or, uh, more or less everything is made on, of aluminium. Oops, that's the wrong one. the whole upper hand assembly. This is one of the pistons. So I got the screws out and what you see here is this little cylinder that moves that way and you can hear it there is air blowing out. When I push it that way, the air comes out here. When I pull it that way, air comes out here. And on the other side, air goes, on, goes in here and air goes in here. Now, this is the, the valve block. I hope my autofocus does it well. Um, these are the connectors for the four valves. There are just two wire cables here, one red, one black. They work with 24 volts DC, as you can see. There is the little LED here that indicates if it's activated or not. Here is the input for all the four valves. This input goes to this tube here. In fact, it's, it's uh, a hole in this aluminium uh, base here. Uh, it goes up to the valves and when the valve is energized, the pressurized air comes out here, here, here or here, depending on which valve is activated. And then, important thing, if you blow air in here, the piston moves that way. But in the same time, the air on this side must find a way out, because it would, if I block this, it's not possible to move that uh, piston out. So, you have to provide a uh, for the air here uh, a way out and the way out here is back uh, so if let's say this valve is activated and this valve is not activated so th the pass here is open to the second tube on this side and goes out to this uh, a silencer here. This is to reduce the noise of the escaping air. 
if you look at it closely I hope I can do that with my camera you will see that uh, this is uh, some brass balls very very small brass balls that are sintered together so they are heated up and pressed together and they make a mesh where air can travel through but it also uh, reduces the, the speed of the air so it reduces also the the noise that it makes okay each of these valves is screwed to that base it can be removed with two screws oops I drop them so that's the entire valve you see here that's the the holes where the air come through from the bottom side we have one two three holes the other two holes is where the screws have been goes to these three openings here depending on the type of the valve this is input output however you call it and I just put it back because I don't want to lose any more parts here So here we have something interesting. This is a flow reduction valve. You can turn this knob here and adjust the airflow that goes into the cylinder here and out of the cylinder. So there is one of this uh, reducing airflow reducers on each valve here so and this is to uh, prevent that the movements here are too quick so these valves here do only open or close they are like digital one zero on off and if you don't have any restriction on the way to the cylinder the cylinder would simply snap around and snap back and that's possibly too fast and here you can uh, adjust the speed of turn or movement uh, as you like it and as probably described in any manual or whatever. That's another interesting detail. This is the input for the entire uh, robotic hand. They go through the aluminium here and here out again. So instead of having some, I don't know, angle bracket hose thing, 
they decided to make holes to this aluminium part here and use that as a as a, a way for the air from one nipple to the other. This example of a hose, like a telephone cord, it's just an air hose. That's the other uh, valve block. You see the construction is the same. Input port, output port, the valves here, and the, the ports that go to the cylinders, one cylinder here, forward, backward, another cylinder here, forward, backward. Then, that's a bit funny, they machined away here the entire edge of the cylinder. Well, it doesn't affect the function of the cylinder, but they needed the space for, well, what was here. I'm not sure. I don't know. Ah, the, there was the, the valve block was here. Okay. So they found Two screws are good enough, okay. So that's the valve, uh, the cylinder for tilting. We have the flow restrictor valve here, because it's only one way. The other way is pushed back by the spring. So it only has to has this uh, way to travel, this working. It works only on this way, so it comes back by itself. Yes, and the air escapes here. To that hole if I hold that back yeah a little bit like so that's the springs for the tilting mechanism and now I remove the two the two springs here and then we can flip the entire unit open and we have access to the screws underneath which uh, hold that uh, pneumatic that rotation cylinder There are two other interesting parts, these linear ball bearings here. They have, uh, like a normal ball bearing, they have balls inside. In four rows they slide over these posts with almost no friction. 
So if we look inside you can see the balls there. It's a row of balls and there are four of these rows over the entire circumference here. As I said, they slide with almost no friction because the balls are rolling up and down. And I'm sure these parts here could be handy for something else. This is the rotational cylinder. It has a 180 degree movement. There are input ports, output ports. And there is certainly a linear cylinder inside this case, which has a linkage to make it turn around here. And the other cylinder here is that that makes the stop at 90 degree. So if that cylinder is activated, the other cylinder stops after half of its travel. Well and that's it. Thanks for watching.